Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for the second session of our Plastics 101 series. It is a four part series. This is part two um, of that series. Thank you all for joining us in these, you know, trying testing times. I know this is a, this is quite unusual for for a lot of us here. Um, hopefully, you're all staying safe. Hopefully. Um, you're all following the advice and the and the guidance that, that we're all getting uh, to stay indoors. Yeah, I echo that, Nikhil. Um, strange times indeed, and straight out of a movie. Um, but yeah, hopefully everyone's safe and sound and listening to the advice. Yep, absolutely. By the way, my name is Nikhil Venkat. I am an application engineer here at Kativ. And the other voice that you just heard was Brian Pelly. He is the MoFlow technical specialist at Autodesk. And hopefully I didn't uh, butcher your, your job title, Brian. <laughs> yep, I've been called worse, Nikhil. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before we, we jump into, into the content for today, one of the things that I wanted to mention was, you know, like I said, we're not quite used to this. Uh, the, this remote working all the time. So what we have done here at Kativ is put together this resources page about working remotely, where you'll see um, some information about you know, how you can kind of work remotely. Here's a webinar that we did fairly recently. I mean, this was this was about last week on remote work and how you can use the tools that you already have um, in you know, as part of your Autodesk software to work remotely. And there are some extended access uh, programs as well. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and post this link in the chat window and you can all go ahead and, and access it. Now, Brian, do you want to jump in and talk about the uh, extension? Oh, yeah. Um... As, as an effort um, to this large wave of folks now working from, from home, uh, which has created a lot of interesting dynamics in online meetings, um, Autodesk has offered uh, uh, free access to cloud collaboration tools such as Fusion 360 and Fusion Teams to help kind of manage uh, sharing and collaboration of, of data. Um, so if you're not familiar with Fusion 360, it does usually come entitled with Moleflow and our other advanced manufacturing products, but this is something we're just offering regardless of who you are, where you are. Yep, exactly, absolutely. So you'll find a lot of information on this page. Check the, feel free to check this out. I just put this in the chat window. All right, let's go back to the real reason we're here, I suppose, uh, Plastics 101. So, why are we here today? Again, you know, if, if you didn't join us on the, on the last session, you can find that up on, up on YouTube. Uh, it is posted. So, you know, I think uh, we, can, we can definitely help you out, direct you the, to that, that link. Uh, but again, we're here to help you guys, our partners, all of you be more successful, more competitive um, in your business through with you know guidance with technology with support and essentially you know we're here as an extended arm for you guys to lean on now kativ is one of a few um, moflow specialized partners autodesk moflow specialized partners what that means is we have been certified by autodesk to actually train you guys and certified as experts um, to support you with your usage and your um, adoption of Moleflow. Now, last time around, we talked about, the big thing that we talked about really was what it takes and how do you do it right the first time, right? So how do you, for example, understand the uh, intricacies of molding before you even, you even start any physical processes, right? So we talked about the four key pillars of, of plastics design. Uh, we talked about 
you know, exploration of those of those four, four pillars. And we also talked a little bit about materials as well. Now, the reason we, we've structured it this way, we're going to touch on each of these individual um, pieces, individual pillars, if you like, uh, over and over again, but they're all going to fall under this, this broad, uh, each of these broad umbrellas. Yeah, it's amazing to me. Um, I spent, you know, four years in school and then a, a lifetime trying to understand and manage the complexity of those four key pillars, uh, material, process, part design, mold design, um, whether it your community trying to optimize your plastic components or an individual, the more you know um, and explore um, these key variables, um, key components, uh, the better decisions you're going to make. Um, and, and, you know, that's the manual approach, whether it be community or individual. Um, in Fusion 360, there's a service called Generative Design. And, you know, just as an example of how much um, content there is around those four key pillars. Uh, we we kind of spilled over last session and didn't really get to talk too much about what I like to call man versus machine, right? So okay. it appears we have lost Brian's audio there. So I'm just going to jump in here. Um, okay. Can you Brian? not hear me, Nikhil? I can hear you now. Okay. So uh, maybe, maybe give me a check on what you last heard. You were talking about, you're talking about uh, Fusion 360 having this uh, yeah. technology okay. in here. Yeah. So it's what I've termed, yeah, you know, it's like man versus machine. It's like all the, these things we need to know and making good decisions for plastic components. Um, we've kind of opened up that artificial intelligence with generative design. So applying um, uh, a solve a problem to the computer, uh, giving uh, maybe some uh, areas that we want to preserve, a space we want to live in, obstacles that we need to avoid, and then allowing the software to run not just an FEA analysis, um, but also shape um, generation based on the process type. And these are two examples um, in the design for manufacturability of that process type and the subset of materials. So a full exploration of these four, you know, kind of key variables is where we're headed. And, you know, for those of you out there, you know, afraid of technology, this is not going to take our jobs just yet. The machine isn't going to take over just yet, but it does augment our decision process. It gives us geometries that we would have never explored, hundreds of geometries that we can kind of pick from where you look at the classic approach where you get shaped surfaces from ID, you get a mechanical designer, and then an FEA reliability analyst that all kind of work together to get to a point where then you pass it to, say, a molding plastics engineer for their two cents on DFM. So the more we can kind of do this up front with tools like this, uh, the more choices, good choices we're going to have in, in the future. And we're going to see this trend more and more. Um, so it's not going to go away. I don't think it's going to take our jobs either. I think it's going to be a good augmentation of uh, our workflows and make us more efficient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, part of why um, it's not going to take our jobs really is because some of these designs, as you can see, they're, they're so complex. There's so much going on here. There's no way you can um, sit down and design, or you would sit down and, and design this and actually create prototypes for each of these to, to figure, figure out what's going on in there. And so we use simulation, right? We do this beforehand on a software of, of some kind and understand what's going to happen, understand uh, the process so it's a little more predictable, so we know what might go on, et cetera. Now, specifically here, we're talking about injection molding simulation. So I get, I get this question a lot. I'm sure you do as well, Brian. What is injection molding simulation? What, what is it? Because, you know, we're, we're on, the, on the shop floor doing 
you know, creating prototypes, understanding what's going on there. What is simulation? Well, there's several ways you can define simulation. The first one is, of course, it's, it is technology that answers some, some basic questions about, about plastic manufacturing, right? So um, is it going to fill? Where, there, where will you see these defects? What's the best gate location to use? Um, are you, is the runner system balanced? Uh, is this the best part geometry? Or is this, the, is this what's going to make it most, most manufacturable? Or do we need to make some changes? You can also define it as a piece of technology that would predict and avoid beforehand manufacturing defects. You can also, uh, depending on who you're talking to, define it as technology that'll help optimize the part design and mold design for manufacturing, right? So it'll help you minimize cycle time, uh, help you become more efficient, help you become uh, a lot more productive as an organization, et cetera. Well, my favorite one really um, is it is an opportunity to save money, right? It's, this is something that resonates with most people. If you're talking to your managers, uh, talking to your president, director, whoever that may be, they are probably aware that a lot of the molds that, that are being created have to be constantly retooled, um, they have to be constantly um, checked and tested for their cooling efficiency and uh, whether or not there's a better way to produce them. That's happening over and over again, and they're probably aware of that. Some of these design considerations, making them upfront, will potentially lead to massive, massive savings uh, down the road. So simulation will def is, a, is a great starting point for this innovation. Now, I know when we say simulation, we typically think about, you know, finite element analysis. We think about uh, the bending of a beam or something like that, right? Something fairly simple. Now, whether you're using a structural simulation solution like Nastran or ANSYS or Abacus or anything else out there, really, and you go ahead and run an FEA on a, on a simple part like this that you see on the left. It's gonna give you some areas that are safe. It's gonna give you some areas that may be slightly critical. It'll tell you what the safety factor is, et cetera. Now, the one advantage that something like Moldflow has, Moldflow is of course an injection molding simulation software, is it will allow you to simulate the process of filling and packing and cooling and warping, et cetera. But what it'll also do is allow you to understand what defects arise from that molding process and how those defects actually help or actually affect the strength and stiffness of a certain material. So in this case, for example, we see that there are certain areas, well, if, if you compare the two FEA images here, the one on top gives you some rough areas of Maybe slight concern, but depending on the color code, uh, red is of course most dangerous. Um, depending on that, you can see that there are certain areas where you you've almost got some kind of crack propagation there, but uh, in the picture at the bottom there. So that's what it's giving you. It's giving you these as manufactured, as molded. Um, effects and it's giving you the it's quantifying that strength and qualifying that strength as opposed to standard FEA where you're designing or where you're running FEA based off of what you've designed in CAD right so what you see on your CAD screen is not necessarily well not necessarily but it's never what you'll eventually get in your hand as a physical part right yeah. the physical part always has some some defects some imperfections etc Yep, just got to look close enough. Um, yeah, some of these artifacts like weld lines um, have a strong signal to um, where you might run an FEA with a perfect CAD model and it looks great where it's actually, in this case, an example where it fails differently um, along the, the weld line in other areas, you know, things like residual stress or 
orientation effects, especially with composites like fiber filled material. So a lot of dynamics that we can add and, and leverage um, the material database in Moldflow, but also passing the as molded data, residual stress, final shape, um, orientation of fibers onto FEA. So we get more accurate, uh, virtually mold it, virtually try to break it. Yep, absolutely. And you, you, you touched on a few different things there, there, Brian. Um, essentially, what you were talking about was the different things, the different areas that, that Moldflow um, can actually help with, right? Injection molding simulation can actually help with. So, for example, if you're doing R&D and you're not quite sure what the best approach is, well, Moldflow will help you with, you know, process exploration, creating, you know, intellectual property. If you're, if you sort of need to get a little creative with your, um, with your process, it helps affect or it affects part design and engineering. So whether something is man manufacturable, moldable, um, whether it's going to actually remain strong enough that it's going to, um, that you can predict, right? Similarly, you know, if you're developing molds, we talked about how expensive molds could be. So how's the cooling? How's the venting? Is the, we talked about again last time, if you, if you look in the chat window, uh, there should be a, a link for the, the last session. One of the things we talked about was what, what is a bad mold, right? How do you define a bad mold? Well, the answer is if you don't get the part that you're looking for out of the mold, that by definition would be a bad mold. So this will help you understand all the factors, all the variables that go into uh, mold design or development. And also, you know, your process development. So what's your, um, what are the different parameters that, that are going to affect your process, right? So whether it's the injection pressure, or the mold temperature, or the melt temperature, whatever that may be, um, this process development a uh, portion of it through mold flow will help you understand which which variable affects the the entire process the most and then you can kind of zero in on, in on that and try to modify that to really understand what that sweet spot is yeah it's a good example of like the evolution of details um early on you you don't have a lot but you can certainly um digitize it or or present it like the as molded data early on when you're doing rel reliability testing. Um, and, and some of the key things there is, you know, from what I've seen is that, you know, 80% of a lot of your root cause issues, root cause to the issues is um, defined by some early decisions during the design process. So the geometry that you're creating for this component, um, the material, selection process has a big impact and then where you can and can't gate it. Um, so not to say that you can't create other issues downstream here uh, with a bad mold design, bad feed system, a cooling or bad process, certainly can. A lot of times though, it's aggravating those three big variables, geometry, material, and potential gate locations. Absolutely. So again, you know, part of, part of what you said was the materials, right? So typically inside the industry, we, we get a lot of, you know, especially with, with material specialists, there, there's a lot of different things that, that they, um, that they tell us, right? So how do you kind of zero in on the, on the best material, where do you find that information? Um, you know, product development costs keep to keep tending to uh, escalate and, and increase due to due to material related issues. So again, as as Brian said, a lot of these things, a lot of these factors, you you kind of need to consider beforehand before you you start, um, you know, putting a shovel in the ground, so so to speak. Now, one way of doing that, of course, if you if you have mold flow, if you already own it, then you know there is this massive material database in there that, that has so much information that it's sometimes 
hard to digest. We're spoiled, uh, Nikhil. <laughs> <laughs> If you go Absolutely. back in time, yeah, when, when I've looked at like other programs, FEA specifically, there's been so little material data where MoFlow we just expect um, and to, to have all this data at our fingertips, you know, things like uh, design of experiments, data on shrinkage, um, so literally DOEs on shrinkage and things of that nature. Very spoiled. <laughs> yep, definitely. Well, I, I guess now uh, folks that have ANSYS are going to be spoiled as well because ANSYS quite recently, I'm not, sh I'm not sure how long ago, probably three, four months, um, they purchased a company called GrantUp and ANSYS now has this um, software called, the Grant, called GrantUp Selector, right? Essentially, it is this massive encyclopedia of materials data, which allows you to compare different materials. It doesn't even have to be different uh, materials of the same class. You know, you can compare like a plastic against a metal against an alloy and try to do this apples to apples comparison of whether it's strength, whether it's, you know, stiffness or cost or availability or whatever it may be, right? It allows you to make those smart materials choices uh, well, well beforehand. So yeah, for those of you that have Moldflow, those of you that have ANSYS, you do have access to these massive materials databases. And if you have both, then, well, you have, you have a lot more materials than you're ever going to use. So, and you've also got, you know, different, in each of these, you've got different grades of materials. You've got, uh, different manufacturers, etc. Now, we've got a couple of uh, really interesting case studies here, Brian. If if you want to run through them real quick, sure. These are you know just basic examples of what happens when you start thinking about using tools to optimize up up front. Um, you know something as uh, simple casual environment as MoFlow Advisor uh, was applied to these two housings to, to simply, you know, reduce wall thickness without impacting, you know, processing. And you can see in, in the bottom in red that the savings are significant. Um, savings can be looked at, a, you know, a couple of different ways, but the low-lying fruits usually uh, a high volume part or an expensive material or a very large like run rate, a large machine. Um, those are generally where I've focused in the past. Uh, what's what's the biggest bang for my buck? What's the low lying fruit? And then expand going after the tougher ones later. And there's a couple other examples here, but basically, you know, being able to balance things and that's kind of some of the um, subject matter that we'll get into in the next uh, couple sessions as far as mold uh, design mode layouts, um, process optimization, but uh, running, um, you know, family molds, hopefully you don't have to do that, but it's uh, tricky. And if you're not filling things at the same time, basically the bottom line is if you're not delivering same melt, temperature, pressures, shear rates, your stress velocities, you're going to get different physical properties and cosmetics, which is always this tug of war in these, so balancing it. Here you can see it saves a good amount of money as well as um, some of these more complex um, parts, looking at this up front to determine, you know, what the ideal gate location. I can't count how many times I've seen gate locations driven by where you can't see it. So a non-cosmetic area or based on the economics of what you think um, the tooling type should be, and we'll get into that, I think next week's subject, but those decisions are made based on economics, but what's the cost of getting a part that you can't use or doesn't perform? Um, and so this is a good example of that upfront stuff that we can look at and some more difficult, you know, consequences or details like core shift. Um, so how is that gonna affect functionality, shape, say roundness or straightness of, of a through hole. And these are all things that we can explore early before we're locked in to that 
decision we make on gate location, tool type. Um, okay, I think that's all we got for cost uh, savings examples. De yeah, def definitely. But you know, part of that is is also knowing what you're looking for to to begin with, right? Understanding what you should be uh, focusing on. You know, what are the the different areas that you need to shine a light on to to actually make sure you get this cost savings advantage, right? Right? You don't want to do an incomplete simulation and then run to the the shop floor, make your prototype, make your mold, and then you realize there's there's some issue. Um, with yep. the cooling or something like that. So a absolutely, there there's a sequence and and uh, kind of workflows. And if you kind of look at the conception of mold flow early on, it it really was based on design principles, theories that that we can apply and that are quite um, well documented as far as you know what what is good, what is bad. Um, could absolutely. lead into this, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. That's a, that's a great great segue into into the actual mold flow design principles. And what you see here, by the way, is a um, fairly legendary, I think it's fair to call it, uh, textbook, reference book uh, for plastics engineers, mold flow design guide by Jay Shoemaker. Um, and most of the time when you're looking for mold flow reference material, this is the first thing that, that pops up. So just, just FYI. One of those things that they talk about in the book is the one of the most basic things is uniform wall thickness, right? First rule of plastic part design is that you would like to have uniform wall thickness. That also happens to be the first rule that's usually broken. So this is the the, the thickness value across the the majority of the part. Of course, it's not as if you're not allowed to have any areas that are that are different. But what we're what we're trying to uh, call uniform here is basically try and avoid these these massive changes in in thickness that are sudden, right? If if there are going to be changes in thickness, make it small, make it subtle, make it gradual. And if there are going to be large changes in thickness, then maybe we need a different approach to to mold that part, right? And we'll run through these fairly fairly quickly. Um, if you would like to talk about any of these in, in detail, if you're seeing issues with any of these, feel free to, to reach out to us. But just in the interest of time, we're going we're gonna to run through this fairly quickly. And this isn't, this isn't ridiculously complex either. Um, I think that, that wall sick, uh, thickness um, is, a, is an interesting guideline because, you, as you pointed out, we, we then apply draft, which you know then mm -hmm. breaks that um, guideline. And I guess one thing to keep in mind is guidelines are always broke. Um, it's just a matter of how severe we we can get a you know away with breaking them. And and that's truly where like simulation comes in um, to kind of believe be that referee, if you will. It's like how extreme can we go um, past this guideline um, before we get into troubled waters, if you will. So th there's a lot of things like draft and undercut and design principles that are meant as guidelines. And we know, you know, we've molded all the easy stuff. Now we see more and more difficult stuff and we see these guidelines broke constantly. And how do you judge that? That's truly where simulation shines. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, simulation as a, as a referee. I'm definitely going to use that in the future. <laughs> well, I got no football or hockey to to watch anymore right now, except reruns. So, <laughs> all right, it's on my mind. <laughs> it's on your mind all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it's like you said, right? So, simulation is something that that will help you understand these things beforehand, and sometimes it also helps you understand things that you simply don't see in a physical part, right? So you can sure you can look at the effects of it and trace it back to the cause but why do that when you can directly look at what's happening right so for one of those things is a controlled and unidirectional flow pattern so these um basically what you're hoping for is orientation in in one single direction for one single um portion of the part i suppose 
And if you have flow in, in all kinds of different directions, right? You see the, the first set of images there. That's going to lead to, to high stresses, to unpredictable warpage, to unpredictable shrinkage, to uh, potentially even, even cooling issues, right? So uh, that, this is another thing to, to consider, just as gate location selection, selection is. So depending on whether you have advisor or, or insight, actually, no, not depending on. But regardless of whether you have advisor or insight, um, you do have the ability to one select up to ten gates, and also second, um, have the software tell you where the best gate location should be. Right? You can also say, yeah, these in this particular part of the geometry, uh, it's going to be fixed to something else. So I don't want any gate location in there. Um, I want the entire region to be gate free and move the injection location elsewhere. So you, you've got the ability to do all of that. And this will help you uh, kind of visualize how the entire mold's gonna get filled depending on the, the gates, the injection location that, that has been selected, right? So whether that's one injection location, whether that's two, three, four, whatever, uh, it'll take that into account and, and show you how that's going to fill and pack. Now, another one that we're looking at, and again, this is one of those advantages of, of running a simulation beforehand, is looking at the pressure gradient, right? So typically what you're hoping for is a constant pressure gradient, which is a uh, the pressure drop per unit length. So you're looking for that to be fairly constant, or you're looking for the pressure rise to be fairly uniform, right? Until, of course, you see that little spike at the end because um, the, the flow front keeps getting smaller and smaller. But if you're going to see spikes through the flow, then that's usually a problem, right? That, that means you have, um, you have some fixing to do. There's you know, an, an issue with some of the, the molding parameters or the issue with the design. Yeah, it's one, one of the key, key things to yeah, result interpretation, which is our, our last uh, session, is like uniformity and why why are we concerned um literally when you have different pressures especially large um, spikes like you're indicating the keel or uh, varying temperatures right there's going to be different cosmetics and different physical properties and that variation is the root cause of most of our evils um if we can minimize that variation um there's you know reduction in risk and some of these uh, are more obvious than others when you get a large spike like this you know what's going to go on in these last places to, to fill you're certainly starving it as far as effective pressure and things along those natures but yeah balance uniformity symmetry some of the key things we like to see yep definitely definitely and, and again you know to that end if you're looking at say the um, the cross -sec cross sectional flow, then in this case you see that you know, you've got one rib that's filled and the other one that's not. That is, uh, that's not ideal, right? If you've got something that is symmetric, then you would hope that they're being or you would expect they're going to be filled at the same time. And if they're not, then maybe you've got to play around with your injection location a little bit. Now you do see some of these artifacts that we that we mentioned previously as well. One of the big ones that is really something that's really difficult to avoid is a weld line or a meld line, right? A weld line is essentially when you've got two flow fronts meeting head on. A meld line is when you have these two flow fronts meeting and they flow in the same direction subsequently. So, like I said, these are these are quite hard to understand, but Having said that, uh, quite hard to, uh, to avoid, but having said that, it is important to be able to predict where they will appear and where they will form. And typically these weld lines tend to be the areas where the part is, is quite weak. So going back to what we talked about earlier with, with um, just running a regular FEA of the CAD model versus running a, an FEA of the as manufactured, as molded, uh, part, 
this is where something like that comes in, right? So you can actually analyze the stresses, analyze the strength of the part at the air, at the region of the weld line, and that will give you a better idea of the strength of the part. Now you've also got, you know, things like hesitation effects, right? So uh, it, it, it is exactly what, what it sounds like. The, the flow front kind of hesitates to, to flow through a certain region. The reasons for that may be, may be varied. It could be your geometry, it could be your gate location, it could be a combination of a lot of different things. Uh, one common way to fix it, of course, is going back to our design, the first design principle, which was uniform wall thickness. So you'll see as we go through this that a lot of these um, issues that we see, a lot of these artifacts that we see can actually be uh, traced back to some of these design principles that were uh, either violated or, you know, just simply not, not followed correctly, right? There's some uniqueness, some um, proprietariness, I suppose, to the, the design that causes it to, to behave slightly differently. But then again, you use Mulch to fix that. Yeah, one of the interesting things about that is um, <clears throat> the, the stall, you know, drops the melt temperature and creates a higher viscosity. So it's a domino effect. And if you still today, um, there's a, a, a great chance that someone might choose to put the gate near that hesitation yeah. to try to force it in there, but you just aggravate that hesitation, ironically. Um, and uh, to your point, Nikhil, like where you place that gate and start building that mold is, you know, a built-in iteration um, in order to compensate. Yeah, absolutely. Now, avoiding um, underflow, this is, again, a, a pretty big one, right? Especially when you've got when you've got components like this, essentially what we're looking for is we want the um, the velocity, the the flow lines, the flow direction to be perpendicular to the uh, the fill contour lines, and anything that's not perpendicular, again, you'll you'll tend to see um, issues with that, right? You'll say you'll tend to see formation of artifacts. You'll start to see formation of weld lines. So in this particular um, instance, you see the, the weld line, instead of being a line, actually starts moving inside the already frozen layer. So sometimes that can actually, you know, benefit as far as washing out the weld line or improving the strength. In other cases, it can cause like distortion through the thickness. Um, so kind of an interesting phenomenon, but truly um, you're seeing like what I like to refer to as is my superpower with mold flow is that x-ray vision to see what's going on, you know, beyond that surface level to mm -hmm. actually look at the internal aspects of these flow dynamics. It's always still amazing to me as far as compressible flow and how complicated it is when you start looking inside. Absolutely. Yeah. What you see in the surface is never what's going on inside. Right. And as a, Analogous to that would be if you're looking at flow through a pipe, you know the flow, the velocity against the wall is actually going to be zero. You know the highest velocity is going to be through the middle. So unless you're analyzing what's happening through the middle of the pipe, you're not really getting the, the full picture of what's going on there. Flow leaders and deflectors. Again, this is another uh, one of those things that that firmly falls into the um, in, into the principles and not rules, got the guidelines and not rules category. So we talked about uniform wall thickness. Well, you, we could have leaders, we could have deflectors, right? But you have subtle increases um, in thickness or subtle decreases in thickness. Well, Great example of violating the design guideline yeah. is uniform wall, but it's an intelligent approach to distributing the, the pressures. So you get uniform pressures or flow front progressions that don't like backfill like this air trap. And so bringing that to the design, the park design is uh, a huge advantage. These integral gating uh, built into the park design or flow leaders, flow inhibitors 
that's when you take a look of like I do tear things apart and you see a plastic component that has these things built into it, you know, that that's a good designer who thought that through. Yep. Now this is another one um, where you, you, you've got the, the molecular orientation um, kind of actually being impacted because, because of the flow. Now, Again, this is this is something we can talk about in in quite some detail. We will we will spare that, uh, spare you that for now. Uh, but if you do want to get more information on this, again, feel free to to reach out to us, and we can we can talk about this in, in depth. Now, this is a this is a big one um, where you you want all of these molds to be filling um, at the same time and. That is the, the the principle of flow balancing or runner balancing. Um, now, this can lead to a whole bunch of different different issues by itself, a whole bunch of different uh, complexities, right? As you can see on this particular um, image on the on the left, you can quite clearly tell that the ones further at the at the back are the ones closer to the top of the picture. They definitely take a lot longer to fill than the ones at the bottom of this or the picture on the left, right? On the right, though, you see they're a lot more even. They're a lot more uniform. There's a um, four thousandths of a difference in four thousandths of a second difference in in how long it takes to fill. And that's okay. That's fairly um, fairly negligible, as opposed to say four tenths of a second. Now again, you know, you need the runners to be large enough that there is, you know, actual heat in the runner, right? You you want the the part to be up, the part temperature to be optimized, and you want to make sure that you can actually control the the heating in there that, that goes through the the runners. Now you know, similarly you're looking at how quickly the uh, the runners are freezing with respect to the part right you don't want that to be a barrier to um to having identical parts to having identical um molded design molded parts now you know similarly again we're looking for um all of this by the way relates to to runner balancing right so if you're looking at um, multiple identical parts, designing them all at once, then absolutely you do need to consider all of these different uh, different factors. And, and in any case, you know it, it, it's definitely good to uh, to have this information about fill time and flow rates. Just because you're you're molding one single part doesn't mean, for example, that you need to um, that you should ignore say the the frozen layer ratio etc yeah and we'll, we'll touch on that next session yep. for sure but there's a lot of complex uh, issues that go into optimizing feed systems it, it boils down to you know what are your goals um you know what are you, what's your quality criteria for the component um the material itself how sensitive that may be to share share imbalances um or uh, material residence time, uh, degradation. Uh, there's no easy button. <laughs> and we'll touch a little bit more on that in the next session, but um, just as much thought, I guess one of the messages um, should be put into the feed systems and the cooling systems for our molds when we get to that point. Yep, definitely. Uh, yeah, as, as Brian said, we'll, we'll definitely touch on on some of this this stuff in the next session, next two sessions, actually. Okay, so this one's a, a fairly obvious one. Uh, shrinkage, we want the shrinkage to be to be predictable, just if nothing else, to be able to understand what the uh, what the allowance in your in your mold should be, right? So that's this one's fairly simple, fairly fairly self-explanatory. Um, and again, you know, some of these things we'll we'll talk about going forward as well. Um, shear stress, again, this is, this is a huge one. Um, the shear stress during the fill has to, has to, has to be less than the, than the critical level. 
Um, if not, then there's a whole bunch of issues that that pop up just, just as a result of that. Similarly, yeah. you know, just one comment about that too, in regards yep. to limit. Um, again, you know, these are guidelines and, yep. and just a, a comment in regards to this may, you know, be a starting point, but say if it's a sensitive cosmetic part, this limit could be a lot higher. Or if it's a, a you know, an easygoing material, say like polypropylene, we know in living hinges, this value is going to far exceed this limit. So again, you're just going to keep the application and material in mind and, and what the quality criteria is. For sure. Similarly, you know, this is another one of those fairly self-explanatory um, principles. You know, you want cooling for the entire molded part to be uniform, fairly uniform at least, right? And if you have non-uniform cooling, um, things tend to bend and warp in a way that that tends to become unpredictable right so always keep in mind you want you want the cooling to be to be as uniform as possible and especially in you know structures like this when you've got uh, box like like structures you will see that the walls will tend to kind of bow inwards almost you know bend inwards and doesn't look like a like a box anymore right it, it just looks like a like a shape of an enclosure that may or may not be uh, may or may not be straight. So for something like this, especially as you get bigger and bigger in size, um, it can it can be fairly important to to see the to see that the the cooling portion of this it remains uniform. All right. So to summarize. Um, this was, of course, session two. What we talked about mainly, what we focused on mainly, was upfront part design. Um, so, how do you kind of make these decisions early on, right? What are the principles? What are the guidelines that you would keep in mind before we uh, made these decisions about part design going in? Now, again, we did talk about a little, talk a little bit about materials as well. Overall, though. Um, it's really hard to kind of divorce these from, from each other, right? Just to separate all of them. So a lot of the principles that we saw with part design, we are going to use in session three. Uh, the big one next time around is process development, uh, mold development, you know, how do you validate the mold design? How do you do a virtual design of experiments, for example, to identify what the, the biggest, um, uh, the most influencing parameter is. So that's what we'll talk about next time around. But if you have any questions right now, feel free to type that into the, uh, the, the chat window and we will be happy to answer them. We actually left enough time for questions this week. <laughs> we did, yeah, we about five minutes for that. So just give you guys a, a couple minutes here to type in any any questions you may you may have and also you know any anything else that you might want to see in here right so I, for example in, in the next session if, if you had any questions about what we're doing next session or next time around or anything that we did this time or even last time for that matter um, feel free to to let us know and by the way. Uh, you should see a few links in the chat window already. So there's one for the, the remote work resources page that, that I pulled up earlier. There's also a link to the, the part one, Plastics 101. And there is another uh, link to a webinar about Granta, the, the material database, the ANSYS material database that we, that we talked about a little earlier as well. Okay. So it looks like we don't have any questions here. Well, in that case, thank you all for joining and hope you have a great rest of the week and uh, stay safe. Thank you.